Hello, everyone. I'm Philip Tai, Director of the Northeastern University Asian Studies Program and Associate Professor of History and Asian Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to our ongoing speaker series, Asia, America, and the World. We are very honored to present our fourth event today featuring Professor Mei Nai. As usual, we have a great presentation on hand. This inaugural series is part of a broader initiative by Northeastern University to address student demands to bring more Asian American studies to campus after the waves of anti-Asian violence and bigotry last spring. We also thought it was important for us to think more expansively about Asian American studies by considering the broader history and the broader dynamics of the Asia diaspora. And I think that the talk by Professor Nay, Professor Nai will do exactly that, um, not only recovering another aspect of Asian American history, um, but by placing Asian American history within a broader global history, recovering the experiences of Chinese workers, but also tracing their role in the making of the modern world, um, the making of modern capitalism, for better or for worse. Before I continue, I want to thank the support of many institutions and individuals here at Northeastern, the Office of the Provost and the College of Social Sciences and Humanities um, for their sponsorship, the Humanity Center for its co-sponsorship, um, Senior Vice Provost Phil He and Dean Ruda Poiger for their ongoing support. I also want to recognize the many people who did the hard work to make this event possible. Our Asian Studies Program team, Mika Morikawa Joe and Ezra Acevedo, the CSSH team of Gabby Fiorenza and Jen Grieve for the logistics, the marketing and communications team of Mike Fra and Najima Holas Huggins, Rachel Mu and her staff and students at the Asia America Center. Um, thank you all very much. Now for today's event, I will invite my colleague, Professor Victoria Kane to offer a few words. She will provide some context that will frame our event and invite our main speaker, Professor Mei Nai, to give her presentation. Afterwards, Professor Kane will moderate the discussion between the speaker and the audience. The audience is welcome to submit their questions in the chat box. And finally, I wanna encourage the audience to stay until the very end. We will announce details regarding a raffle to win copies of Professor Nye's book, Do Not Miss Out. And with that, let me introduce our moderator and speaker today. Professor uh, Kane, Victoria Kane, is Associate Professor of History at Northeastern. She is a social and cultural historian interested in histories of media, technology, and education in 20th century US. She is the author of the award-winning Life on Display, Revolutionizing U.S. Museums of Science and Nature, co-authored with Karen Rader. She's also just published a new book, Schools and Screens, A Watchful History. Professor Kane's research has been supported by numerous foundations, including the Mellon Foundation and the Spencer Foundation. Her latest project examines the history and politics of adolescent privacy. Our main speaker today is Mei Nai, who is Lone Family uh, professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History and co-director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University. She is a U.S. legal and political historian interested in questions of immigration, citizenship, and nationalism. Her pathbreaking and award-winning books include Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens, and the Making of Modern uh, America, The Lucky Ones, one Family and the Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America, and most recently, The Chinese Question, The Gold Rushes and Global Politics. Professor Nye has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Study, the Library of Congress, among others. She has written on immigration history and policy for numerous outlets, including the Washington Post and the New York Times. Before becoming a historian, she was a labor union organizer and an educator in New York City, working for District 65 UAW and the Consortium for Worker Education. She's now writing a new book, Nation of Immigrants, A Short History of an Idea. Her talk today is based on her new book, The Chinese Question, The Gold Rushes and Global Politics. Thank you again for your time. And here, Professor Kane, I will hand it off to you. I am so honored to be moderating this talk by Professor Mei Nai. Her new book fits well within the Northeastern History Department's own emphasis on world history, as well as the university's renewed commitment to the broader field of Asian American studies. 
Professor Nye's book expands our understanding of the origins of Chinese communities in the Anglo-American world, as well as Chinese migrants' varied roles in the American, Australian, and South African gold rushes of the 19th and early 20th century. By placing Chinese migrants at the center of her investigation of these three international contact zones, she forces historians to reconsider the stories they thought they knew. Her book brilliantly illuminates the ways that ideas about race and money transformed global economic and political relationships in the 19th century. She adds meaningfully to current historical debates about the power of race and racism within the history of capitalism, by upending long-standing assumptions about the history of Chinese exclusion and the history of Kuliism. Finally, her comparative approach enables historians of the Asian American experience to explore the ways in which the lives of Chinese workers in the California gold mines resembled and departed from those of Chinese workers in the Australian colony of Victoria and the deep mines of Witwatersrand. The Chinese Question is a book of extraordinary ambition, extensive research, and penetrating insight. It's also just really fun to read. <laughs> um, so welcome, Professor Nye. We are so glad that you will be speaking to us this afternoon. Thank you, Professor Kane, for that uh, very lovely and generous introduction. And thank you, Professor Tai. Um, thanks to Northeastern University, Office of the Provost, and the College of Social Science and Humanities. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be with you today. My book is about the origins of the Chinese diaspora in the West um, and the rise of racist movements and exclusionless legislation passed against them. I look at the regime of Chinese exclusion um, that was enacted not just in the United States, but throughout the Anglophone world. Immigration and citizenship laws are nation-based systems but nations also copy, borrow, and adapt from each other. So in this project, I was interested in the relationship between the local and the global, both in the formation of diasporic communities and in the politics of racism and resistance. The Chinese question was simply this, were Chinese a racial threat to so-called white men's countries and should they be excluded from immigration and citizenship? Exclusion was a radical idea in the 19th century because it contravened prevailing norms of free trade and free migration. Chinese exclusion policy was born of an alchemy of race and money that was part of the globalization of the late 19th century and integration of the global economy at an unprecedented scale. Chinese exclusion was part of a new way of imagining, organizing, and governing the world. I locate the origins of the Chinese question in the gold rushes in the second half of the 19th century, focusing on California and Australia uh, in the colony of Victoria, and in the early 20th century in gold mining in the British colony of the Transvaal. The gold rushes launched into motion hundreds of thousands of people from the British Isles, continental Europe, the Americas, Australasia, and China. Notably, these were the first occasions of large scale contact between customers, that is Europeans and white Americans and Chinese. There are three major themes in my book. First um, is my, was my ambition to slay the coolie myth, central to the rationale that Chinese should be excluded from the countries of the West was the idea that they were a coolie race, indentured laborers, innately servile and docile, ruled by despotic masters, and as such posed a threat to free labor and democratic government. This myth was further perpetuated by historians, a trend that began in the 1960s with the historian Gunther Barth and his book, Bitter Strength. Barth cherry-picked quotes from congressional hearings that alleged that Chinese were contracted or indentured labor, but he ignored other testimonies that claimed otherwise. Barth's intention was to show that Chinese as sojourners and unfree people were the exception that proved the rule of European immigrant assimilation. 
After Barth, other scholars have quoted him in the same quotes. It's as though no one actually went back to the original source. Were they lazy? Were they just sloppy? I don't know. Whatever the reason, I believe this created an Orientalist blind spot in the historiography. So to slay the Cooley myth for me first was an empirical question. What was the social and labor organization of Chinese on the gold fields and thereafter? Asian American historians have not really delved deeply into the gold mining period, even though it's the first instance of large scale Chinese immigration. This is mainly a problem of sources. In California, they are very sparse and scattered. So my research involved going through many, many haystacks to pull out some needles. But in Australia, the colonial government kept excellent records, records that were much fuller and were organized. This allowed me to identify similarities in patterns in California and Australia, corroborating, as it were, evidence from California by way of Australia. Second, I addressed the Cooley myth as a political and discursive question. How did anti-Chinese politics arise on the gold fields in different national and colonial contexts? And how did they evolve into a global racial discourse? And third, I think about the relationship between the exclusion laws in the West, the rise of the international gold standard as the monetary standard in, in world trade and China's position in the global economy. So let me discuss each of these uh, briefly in turn. First, Chinese immigration to the gold fields. The general pattern that I discovered was that Chinese were both a part of mainstream gold field economies and apart from European uh, American mainstreams, a part of and apart from. For example, they used the same labor techniques as others, and they were part of congeries of prospectors across the gold fields, especially in the placer and hydraulic stages. Gold seekers on the California and Victorian gold fields worked as partners in small cooperative groups and on wages for large companies. Like white Americans, Chinese worked with people who were relatives or from their hometowns, although village and lineage ties were stronger in the Chinese case. Chinese favored two kinds of organization in particular. One was the small company headed by an investor manager, typically a local merchant, perhaps himself a former gold digger, uh, who hired upwards of 20 men or leased their claims to others. And the historian Su Fan Chung has written about these companies. The other form was the egalitarian cooperative, typically six to 12 men who shared all profits and expenses and had no boss. The cooperatives usually comprised members of secret brotherhood societies, fictive kin collectivities that were all related to the Zhigongdang, which started as an exile group from the Taiping Rebellion in China and spread throughout Southeast Asia, North America, and Australia. In Australia, it was known as the Yi Xing. In South Africa, Uh, Chinese were not independent prospectors, but indentured laborers who were recruited for work in the underground mines of the Witwatersrand after the South African War. The Chinese on the Rand were mostly from Northern China, another difference between uh, them and the US and Australia where they came from Southern China, but fictive kinship groups and kinship groups also existed on the Rand and were key to organizing resistance among the workers. Contrary to all expectation, the Chinese mining laborers in South Africa were not docile, but resisted their conditions both actively with job actions and riots and passively with large numbers of them deserting the mines or simply refusing to drill more than the absolute minimum number of inches to get paid. On the politics of Chinese exclusion, um, the Cooley trope originated in California where it drew from the proximate examples of indentured Asian labor in Caribbean plantation colonies after the, excuse me, after the abolition of slavery and African slavery in the American South. The association of Chinese labor with slavery was a kind of racial shorthand that cast Chinese as a racial danger to free labor. It was first used in 1852 by John Bigler, California's first governor, who was in a tight race for reelection. Bigler raised the Cooley myth to agitate voters in the mining districts where independent prospectors were anxious over the declining placers and the entrance of capitalized deep mining. This was a classic strategy taken from the nativist playbook, 
appeal to a grievance with a theory of racial difference and weaponize it for a partisan gain. Within days of Bigler's address, Chinese community leaders responded. Yuan Sheng, a businessman in San Francisco Chinatown, had been a merchant in South Carolina in the 1820s and was a naturalized US citizen. In a letter to the governor that was printed in the Daily Alta, he wrote, you have degraded the Negro because of your holding him in involuntary servitude and because for the sake of the union in some of your states, such as tolerated. Amongst this class, you would endeavor to place us, and no doubt it would be pleasing to some would-be freemen to mark the brand of servitude upon us. But we are not the degraded race <clears throat> you would make us. We came amongst you as mechanics and traders and following every honorable business of life. In the 1870s, anti-Chinese racism became an incendiary political force in San Francisco, with the Chinese must go being the central demand of the so-called Workingmen's Party, which itself would soon be co-opted by the Democratic Party. The Chinese question revived in the context of changing economic landscape after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. The railroad did not bring unalloyed prosperity to the Pacific coast. It brought more people from the East adding to unemployment, as well as cheap mass produced goods from the East cutting into the market of craftsmen and artisans. Chinese workers were not responsible for these broad trends, but they were useful as a scapegoat. Eventually anti cooliism triumphed in national politics, but only after revising the Burlingame Treaty with China, which provided for free immigration and overcoming the legacy of anti-slavery politics in the North. Chinese exclusion passed Congress in 1882 during the general retreat from reconstruction with a political alliance between the West and the South, the two bastions of conservative politics and white supremacy at the time. And if I may say to this day. The coolie trope is so ubiquitous in the United States, I was surprised that it was not part of the anti-Chinese discourse on the Australian gold fields. But it would not have had purchase there because the history of unfreedom in Australia was not African slavery, but convict transportation of the English and Irish poor. Anti-Chinese racism was more inchoate on the, on the Victorian gold fields. There was no theory of cooliism like the one that had developed in California. More relevant was Australians' insecurity at being a small population at the fringes of the British Empire in Asia, less than half a million in 1850, who feared being overwhelmed by China's large population. The Melbourne Argus wrote, geographically, we are nearer the pent up millions of China than any other large tract of country occupied by the white man. We are still but a handful of men and women and children. The coolie trope entered Australian politics later in the 1870s and 80s, when it became adopted by white working men's movements in the cities, even though Chinese labor was not in any of the cities a substantial threat to white labor. The urban labor movement in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland adopted coolie themes from California, which served to rally trade unions to the nationalist agenda unabashedly called white Australia. In South Africa, skilled white workers on the mines included many Australian emigrants, including the leaders of the British trade unions. They were direct carriers of anti coolism and the white Australia policy. Another source of anti-Chinese politics uh, was Afrikaner politics, which viewed Chinese labor as a threat to poor whites who suffered from high levels of unemployment and poverty after the South African war. Although Chinese indentured labor was strictly controlled White South Africans feared they, that they would make their way into semi-skilled and skilled jobs and pave the way for their even greater fear that native African workers would do the same. This was a time when the color line in South Africa had not yet hardened. The Chinese question was a problem that complicated the so-called native question and its resolution, that is exclusion, was necessary for that problem to be fully addressed. And Chinese, the Chinese question in South Africa shot into metropolitan British politics as a key campaign issue in the 1906 general elections in Great Britain. Charges that the Chinese on the Rand were held in conditions of slavery 
or akin to slavery, help bring the Liberal Party to power, overturning 20 years of nearly continuous conservative rule. It was especially powerful for liberals' labor allies, which echoed the abolitionist rhetoric of the liberals, but which was, in my view, more moved by the question of working class emigration to the British settler colonies, which they viewed as their own racial prerogative. So in these ways, the Chinese question and the Cooley trope circumnavigated the Anglophone world, starting in California and adapting as it moved across to the Antipodes and then to South Africa and then to metropolitan Brooklyn. Uh, Britain itself. To the extent that these, these whites criticized the so-called slavery of Chinese workers, they never called for their freedom, they never called for free immigration, they never called for equal rights or for access to citizenship, they called for their exclusion. So in the last part of the book, I consider the relationship of the exclusion policies in the West to China's position in the global economy and global politics. Most directly, exclusion meant fewer outlets for Chinese merchants and investors in the West. Exclusion meant a shrinking population of Chinese and a shrinking market, and many of the biggest merchants in California and Australia returned to China or relocated elsewhere. For example, many Chinese retailers left Australia, and some of them founded the big department stores in Shanghai and Hong Kong that built chains throughout Southeast Asia. This reflects a general trend in which exclusion policies redirected the energies of Chinese immigrant labor and capital to Southeast Asia. The decline in silver prices relative to gold in the late 19th century had a direct impact on China, whose monetary system continued to be based on silver when gold, the gold standard came to dominate international trade. The declining gold price of silver meant uh, most importantly, that China's imports were costlier. The gold standard also influenced the second major round of war indemnities imposed upon China around the turn of the 20th century. At mid-century, the opium war indemnities of 7.5 million pounds were reckoned in silver dollars and tails. After the first Sino-Japanese War of 1896, Japan demanded a 50 million pound indemnity, an enormous increase, and demanded it to be paid in gold. China had to borrow on the international market at a time when silver prices were declining. The indemnity allowed Japan not only to pay for the cost of the war, but also to establish sufficient reserves to adopt gold as its monetary standard. Its deposits in London established credit for the construction of Japan's first steel mill. The Boxer Protocol of 1901 was even more punishing. The eight powers, Europe, the US, and Japan, demanded an indemnity of 67.5 million pounds in gold over 39 years at 4% annual interest. By 1938, China had paid out over 91 million pounds. I want to end with a little um, to, to share with you um, something that I found very interesting uh, in my research. Two American economists who wrote about China's foreign trade in the early 20th century made a special note of the role that Chinese overseas remittances played in China's balance of trade accounts. Remittances range from an estimated $50 million a year between 1902 and 1913 and double that amount by the late 1920s. Counted as assets, remittances enabled China to carry a modest net surplus in its balance of trade. And even as exclusion policies shut Chinese out of the social and economic mainstream in the West, the emigrants carried gold dust home in the linings of their jackets and sent foreign exchange through silver letters, or what they call jinxin. The fluctuating rates of exchange between gold and silver were not just matters for accountants and financiers. Chinese immigrants followed them as well. They always knew how remittances sent in foreign exchange to Hong Kong would translate to local currency in southern China. One of the ironies of the Chinese question is that overseas Chinese in the United States, Australia, and Southeast Asia held on to their savings and remitted large amounts to China when the price of silver dropped. So I'm going to end there. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to um, conversation with uh, Professor Kane and the audience.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Nye. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to get things rolling by actually asking how you came to this topic. <laughs> how did you get interested in this particular aspect of Chinese migration and sort of broader global history? Uh, my first, my interest was first peaked um, when I was researching my, my second book, The Lucky Ones, um, which involved um, a family of Chinese interpreters. And through that research, I came upon a transcript of a court hearing in um, Sierra County in the 1880s, uh, in which uh, everybody in the courtroom, including the, the defendant, the witnesses, and the judge and the prosecutor were all speaking in pidgin or Chinglish. Um, but I didn't, it didn't make it into the book because they were not part of the, that book ended up being about one family and they weren't part of the family. But I was interested in the, the gold mining um, because they, these were gold miners, both the um, defendant and the, the victim were gold miners. So I was interested in that. And then um, the second thing that happened was uh, a few years later, I was ad, uh, advising a student uh, a, a, at Columbia who was writing his honors thesis on working men's politics in California in the 1870s and 80s. And he wrote that the Chinese were coolies. And I said, that's not right. They're, they weren't coolies, they were voluntary immigrants. And he said, but it says so here in this book, right? And he showed me Gunther Barth's book. And then he showed me other articles that he had found that quoted Barth. So then I, I came upon this problem in the historiography where everybody cites the same person but that person was um, actually, I think, deliberately um, not honest in how he used the evidence. You know, he was citing from testimonies that were thousands of pages uh, long. And so I went back and looked at the testimonies and yeah, the people he quoted were there, but so were all other kinds of people and other quotes. So I said, this is really a problem. So, um, so that's when I said, I've got to slay the Cooley myth because because he said, well, show me, show me others. He was open about it. He said, show me other things. And I, I couldn't. It was very hard to pinpoint sources that disproved it other than what other people were saying in these testimonies. So I knew it was going to be a big empirical challenge because the sources in California in this time period are very scattered. Um, so that's how the hunt started. So that raises a really, I mean, as an Americanist, I read this book and I was sort of staggered by the transnational scope. And this is a big, ambitious project, especially given the fact that you are dealing with a series of populations which may or may not have fragment, fragmentary records. Um, and you talk about, you know, you, you just brought up the fact that, you know, the source base is complex and the secondary sources, if they exist at all, are deeply flawed. So what I'm wondering is how, how did you get around, I mean, this seems like an enormously challenging project to comb through the sources that do exist. How did you, I mean, what did you see as the most challenging aspect of these transnational sources? Um, you know, walk us through the process of doing this kind of transnational history. Well, there definitely were times when I thought I had bitten off more than I could chew. <laughs> and there were other times when I thought I lost my mind, um, but uh, I, I, I just stuck to it. Um, you know, I was also very fortunate, you know, I mean, I, Columbia was very generous and I got fellowships and research funds. So I was able to go to Australia. I went to Australia several times, you know, I spent, I spent quite a bit of time there. Um, in the archives and going to visit the gold country and the little towns. Um, and I, I was in South Africa once when I went to the archives. And then um, I, didn't, I didn't have a, a lengthy stay there. So I ended up hiring uh, somebody to go back to, into the archives and to photograph um, the records that, that I, I hadn't gotten the first time. But um, What's interesting is that in both South Africa and in Australia, the records were much better because they were government records, they were well kept, you know, and they did not exclude the Chinese from the official records. So you could go through ledgers of 
mining claims and you could see the names, you could tell the Chinese names by, by their name and you could see the patterns of ownership. And so this was a much more uh, robust kind of um, uh, uh, data. Uh, and then I, then as I mentioned in my talk, I could compare it to slivers that I had seen in California. I said, oh, that's the same pattern. You know, this, this is a cooperative, you know, this is, you can see it in both California and Australia, the claims register will say, will have six names. And after each name, it will say one, six, one, six, one, six, one, six, right? It, you know, to six. And so then, you know, it's six people with equal shares in a claim. And then if you see another claim that maybe is larger, but only one person owning it, then you figure, well, he must be managing it and hiring other people because um, he couldn't, he couldn't mine it by himself. It was too big. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, figuring this way. Um, and there were also, there were also differences, you know, and um, so uh, it took a long time. And I also had to, um, I had to learn about, uh, I mean, I was trained as an Americanist. So I had to learn about Australian history. I had to learn South African history. I had to study more of Chinese history. I had to learn more about the British Empire. So I kind of felt I was a graduate student again, studying for you know, my exams with, with new fields. Um, and then I had help, you know, frankly, I, I turned to colleagues in Australia and South Africa and in Britain, and I asked them to read what I had written and to correct the errors I made. And I made a lot of errors. So um, I'm very thankful uh, to the generosity of some of my uh, colleagues who helped uh, set me straight on things that I had gotten wrong. I, ho I hope I got most of it right. I don't know. I, I, you know, any errors that are in there are mine alone. Well, it's nice that it's a monument to kind of scholarly generosity as yes. well as your own shoe leather and obviously <laughs> like incredible research um, and analytical you know, lens. Um, we have a question from the audience. Margaret Wu points out the parallels uh, between the Cooley myth and many of the myths that circulate today around immigration and immigrants. And I would love it if you could comment on what you see as those parallels and then also what the role of historians can be in combating or at least addressing uh, the similar kind of misinformation that circulates today. Right, thank you. And thank you, Margaret, for that question. That's really important and it's on a lot of people's minds, um, understandably so. Um, I think there are there are striking parallels. Um, in some ways, you could say the Chinese question never really went away, um, but I think it's also important to understand the different contexts. Um, in my view, uh, the important thing to understand about race and racism, and in a, in a sense, what I was trying to do with this book is to show that racism is um, a product of history and politics. People, you know, people aren't born, humans aren't born with a race gene, right? Um, or any, any ideological gene, right? It, it, people's thinking and, and outlooks and politics are all produced his, in historically specific contexts. And, um, and, and if we understand that, then we have perhaps a way to think about changing things through politics, right? Through our own organizing and, and um, advocacy and activism. And the thing about, um, and if we understand race as something that's historically produced, then we also need to understand that it is reproduced through history and it, it changes, right? Because what John Bigler said in 1852 actually had to be updated even in the 1870s when it, became an urban movement. And then if you fast forward into the 20th century, anti-Chinese racism took other, you know, made, took other forms, right? And in the 20th century, especially, um, even though during the exclusion era, there was still a lot of stereotypes about Chinese workers being uh, passive or, or docile um, or coolie like um, The other thing that reproduce anti-Chinese racism um, 
was a whole series of US military engagements in Asia and the Pacific. And so those wars also generated new racial stereotypes about Chinese and other Asians, which continue to influence um, American popular thinking or politics. So today we have, um, in some ways, a very different situation. I mean, you know, in the 19th century, China was seen as a, a kind of colonial prize for the West, um, and and also the effort to exclude Chinese immigration and to contain China, I think, was a response to what they thought was a potential threat of China in the world because of, just because of its size. In the 21st century. China is a major economic player in the world economy. And it's that competition and the threat of China's economic power, I think that drives anti-Chinese sentiments today. Um, so I think that that's a very complicated issue. You know, um, China and the United States are both competitors, but they also are economically interdependent. Right, they're not they're not only competitive; they also have interdependency. So it's a very difficult situation to navigate. And so once people like Trump and now Biden consider relations with China to be a zero sum game, then it has all kinds of negative consequences um, for both countries, and I think in particular for Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, who we always reap, you know, the whirlwind in terms of uh, what policy, foreign policy is towards China. And the Cooley myth has come back today, I think, in, in two figures. One is the figure of the Chinese factory worker in Shenzhen or other economic um, export zones, you know, who make the iPhones or, or sneakers or whatever. Um, and the other figure, the coolie, is the Chinese international student or Chinese American or Asian American university student um, who, uh, by stereotype, you know, studies way too hard, you know, studies uh, many more hours a week than is than a normal kid would study. Um, and so both the factory worker in China and the Chinese student in the university are seen as um, automatons, robots. They labor um, extreme hours. They are under the whip of either the Communist Party or Tiger Mothers, you know. And and so this is all considered to be unfair competition, right? How can you expect white middle class kids to compete with the Chinese kids because they're not normal. So even, even the stereotype of the model minority is kind of a pathology, right? It's not, they're not normal, right? So I think you see this idea of the Cooley trope kind of sneaking back in. Um, they're, not, they're not called Cooleys per se, perhaps, um, but that's the idea that it draws upon. So I think we have many of those same, same ideas out there today and we have to combat them. We actually have a, a wonderful question from you know another audience member, which provides a really nice transition from that. Um, and Selvet uh, asks a little bit about again this notion of the Cooley trope, um, and says that thanks to the growing scholarship on indenture, and indeed, thank you, thanks to your own work, um, we know quite a bit about the image and racialization of Chinese workers do, during the Cooley age. But um, the questioner asks if you could expand upon what your sources told you about what these workers thought of themselves, um, how they you know, sort of identified and how they saw their own experience in contrast to the stereotypes and myths that were projected upon them. That's a really great question. And um, in the sources, you don't always you don't always know what people are thinking, but you can, you can see what they were doing. Um, and so what were these, what were Chinese mine workers or miners doing? Um, they were tenacious, 
They, um, they fought to defend their claims, sometimes with weapons. Um, they, uh, they organized uh, petitions um, and they, there were Chinese spokespersons who were often more educated Chinese merchants and um, people who were educated who spoke out and we do, know, we do have their voices. Um, they were not the miners themselves. Sometimes they were former miners. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot written by Chinese leaders protesting the Cooley myth and um, advocating for their rights. But if we want to know what, what the ordinary Chinese miner or mine worker was thinking, um, we, don't have, we don't have, for example, like caches of letters that they wrote or diaries or things like that. Sometimes we, there's, there's a few diaries that are out there or a few things that people wrote, but not that many. But if you look in general at what they were doing and how they were uh, defending themselves, how they protested attacks against them. You know, in California, there would be um, instances where white miners would chase Chinese off of a claim or off of say a whole stretch of a river. They would they would um, attack them physically, they would run them off. Uh, and then the Chinese would come back. <laughs> they come back like a week later. And, and so they could never really permanently displace people um, in large part because the Chinese just came back and fought and they retook their claims. And, um, and after a while, the whites didn't wanna spend all their time fighting with them. You know, so uh, these are all these little things that you you find, um, you know, with this instance I'm just speaking about. Um, how do I know that? Well, I don't have a story. I don't have an eyewitness that showed people being run off and come back. I mean, there are newspaper accounts about how they were run off. But then if you look at um, census records or you look at uh, directories, you look at local records, you see that you know um, a short time later people were back, so um, you can start to piece together an understanding of how um, how how people behaved, right? So that that's just a couple of examples. Um, but I would say that you know um, the stereotype that Chinese just uh, were hapless victims uh, because they were docile uh, is completely not true. I mean, you know, in any any group of people, sometimes people will fight back, and sometimes people will just retreat. I mean, that's not that those behaviors are not necessarily racial or cultural traits. I mean, people have different instincts and respond differently when they're threatened, right? That it depends on the situation, right? So Chinese, like others, sometimes they would flee and come back later, or sometimes they would fight. And, um, and so, and, and, and South Africa, man, South Africa, they, they, had, they had thousands of people in the mining compounds fighting the police with rocks and iron jumpers and bottles. And, you know, they would wait till the police would charge them. They would wait till the horses were just almost to the, to the workers. And then they would set upon them with bricks and bottles, right? And they would, um, you know, so they were very they were very smart about how to how to fight. Um, so there are lots of examples in the book of um, resistance, and some of it is uh, actually I think surprising uh, to those of us who've been brought up on on the stereotypes. One of my favorite things about the book is that you tie these both you know, sort of everyday acts of resistance, as well as the more spectacular, right. um, you know, like assertions of independence and resistance to the formation of kind of community support groups, right? Like there, you know, they, there are all of these various um, conglomerations uh, within kind of these Chinese worker communities that get started. Um, and one of our uh, questioners actually sort of brings, connects these two concepts, the idea of creating active communities and resistance. And Mark Johnson, um, the questioner's name, he asks how interconnected um, in these three sites were Chinese workers 
in advocating against mistreatment. Um, you know, were miners at these three sites or political activists or indeed Chinese workers around the world um, active and connected? Were there trends or individuals or movements that linked their efforts? Uh, in a very broad sense, yes, they were connected. Um, they were connected by various means. First, um, they, uh, those um, leaders who published pamphlets or, or articles, um, they were read by their counterparts in other countries. So Chinese in Australia read things that Chinese in California wrote and vice versa. Um, they wrote to newspapers so Chinese, Chinese in South Africa wrote to newspapers in China telling, saying, hey, don't come to South Africa to work. It's a hellhole. You don't want to come here. So there is communication that, that does exist. Also um, uh, in Australia and in California, most of the Chinese come from the same counties in Southern China. So they are also uh, loosely connected through um, uh, clan or, or, or village or county um, associations. Um, and uh, I mentioned the Zhigong Dang, the uh, Secret Brotherhood Society. That's an international network. It's a very loose network, um, but they, they communicate. Um, so we have some traces of those communications in uh, when you see newspaper articles showing up in one place, uh, having letters sent from another place, um, but you also have uh, organizations that are loosely connected, loose networks. And then by the 1890s and early 1900s, you have the emergence of political parties that are um, exile groups from China, anti-Qing organizations, um, that are active throughout the Chinese diaspora. So the most, uh, the largest and most influential group was the, um, reform, the um, reform the Empire Society, right? The Bao Hong Hui. Um, and that was led by uh, Kang Yo Wei and uh, Liang Qi Chao. And these two men um, traveled throughout the diaspora. Um, Kang Yo Wei, I mean, they were both pushed into exile by the Empress Dowager, right, in the late 1890s. And they, um, uh, Liang went to uh, Japan and uh, Kang Yo Wei went to Canada. Uh, but Liang also toured Australia and the United States and wrote extensively about both countries. Um, so they organized throughout the diaspora, they raised money for their party, they started businesses all over North America and Mexico and Southeast Asia. They raised a lot of money. Um, they finally kind of fell apart. Um, uh, the the, the, the um, uh, diasporic businesses uh, didn't, didn't last that long, but they, they invested a lot of, uh, in a lot of enterprises. And, uh, and Sun Yat-sen was uh, famously um, raised money and agitated and organized. Um, he, uh, starting in Hawaii, but also in other parts of the diaspora. So from very kind of loose associations through family um, associations and uh, village associations to the secret brotherhood societies, and then increasingly with more sophistication with um, political parties and, um, and the proliferation of print media, right, by the... Um, early 20th century, uh, where um, every Chinese community has a newspaper and they write to each other. So I don't think, I wouldn't go so far as to say that they coordinated their resistance, but they um, shared their ideas. Um, and just as whites um, shared their ideas with each other um, and uh, coalesced around a coolie uh, theory uh, globally, um, the Chinese too um, uh, connected to each other in response to that. Professor, well, let, me, let me just say the last piece, which I talk about in the book, the last okay. piece of connection were the Qing um, uh, ambassadors and diplomats 
um, who increasingly were stationed in the West. And they were another source of, um, of, uh, of, of networking around the Chinese question. Yeah, so Sorry, I mean, yeah. you've done a wonderful job teasing out these flows, right, of ideas, of money. Um, and our next uh, participant in this questioning, Emily Wilcox, is interested in the flows of people from continent to continent. And she writes, I found your map showing flows of migration to gold fields around the world fascinating. Did Chinese laborers migrate between sites in the US, Australia, and South Africa? And if so, did these flows and interactions forge a particular kind of transnational network distinct from the diasporic Chinese networks centered in Southeast Asia in this era? Um, there are some people uh, who go from gold field to gold field. Um, there are, uh, I mean, California is the first gold rush, right, in 1848, 49. By 1850, people from all over the world have gone to California. When gold is discovered in Australia, um, well, there are Australians that go to California, but when gold is discovered in Australia, there are people in California who go to Australia. And so you have a, a phenomenon of um, serial rushers, I call them, who go from uh, gold field, gold rush to gold rush. One of the first research projects I ever did, I was a graduate student. I was researching a project for um, the New York City uh, Transit Museum. And I was researching the people who dug the tunnels around 1901, 1902 uh, for the what's now the number one train. And I found, I found Cornish miners who had come by way of the Yukon. Oh my gosh, this, the original <laughs> sand hogs. Right. right. <laughs> so, you know, these, these were mine. So these are the serial rushers, I call them. But then, you know, not everybody went from place to place. I mean, other people settled down in, in their, the gold fields where, and they became, you know, the prototypical founding citizens of these settler societies. So I don't find a lot of Chinese who are serial rushers. I think there are some, um, they're not as many. I think if they um, were disgusted or, or just didn't make enough money where they were, they would tend to go back to China and not necessarily go to another gold field. Um, I did not find, I don't know if I found any Chinese who had been um, at another gold field. Um, if, they, if they left California, if they left Victoria, they tended to go back to China. But I did find um, educated Chinese uh, and merchants who, um, one of the figures in my book is um, in South Africa, is a, an educated, young educated Chinese man who um, actually for a, a while works for a South African mining company and then quits because um, they don't like him conveying the complaints of the workers, right? But he came from Hong Kong but before that, he came from Australia. His, he was born in Australia. His father was a merchant in Australia. And then he and his family left and went to Hong Kong in the late 1880s. And they don't say why, but that was a time of um, high agitation against the Chinese. So they might have left because um, there was a lot of racism um, peaking at that time in Sydney. So they go to Hong Kong and they're active in politics. They, they um, associate with Sun Yat-sen and a, a failed insurrection at one point. And then um, one of the brothers, this, this guy, Shea, that I talk about, he goes to South Africa. So I did find somebody who traveled around a bit, but he wasn't a gold miner per se. Uh, Professor Tai would like to join the conversation at this point. Professor Tai? Hi, thank you, Professor Kane. Um, I guess I just wanted to uh, jump in and just ask a few of my own questions uh, to Professor Nye. Um, one thing that I thought about when reading this book was that it reminded me of something that I, I used to joke to my students, which is that Chinese laborers during the 19th century were sort of the essential workers of their day. Um, mm. Basically, um, providing indispensable 
um, but cheap and not valued um, labor. And what they did, of course, was to exploit um, resource frontiers. Um, they played an important role in uh, developing dispossessed land. Um, so they were critical um, in some ways to uh, the, the making of modern nations, modern empires, and also um, modern capitalism. Um, and I wanted to ask you and take a step back and think about sort of the larger story that you're sketching. What is it, you know, how, how, how do we take this story, this global story of Chinese um, workers um, in these uh, gold fields and, you know, maybe talk about like, how does it change our understanding of the history of, of capitalism? Um, you know, our, our, our understanding of how capital, you know, the, 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 the emergence of, of modern capitalism. Well, thanks, uh, Professor Tai. That's a great question. Um, you know, Chinese in, in the gold fields, they weren't really that different than other gold miners. You know, they they comprise about 25% of the gold mining population in Victoria and in California in the 1850s and 60s. So they're a substantial minority, um, but their labor wasn't, uh, wasn't exploited in a special way that, that you're referring to. But I think after the gold rushes, that phenomenon um, emerges, right? As they move into other areas of work. Um, Chinese were uh, essential workers in reclaiming farmland in the California Delta, right? Making it uh, suitable for large scale agriculture. Uh, Chinese famously built the Western part of the Transcontinental Railroad, right? Uh, in big infrastructure work, um, which the railroads uh, recruited Chinese because they couldn't get enough whites to, to do that work, right? The, the whites in California at the time, white labor, um, a lot of it, a lot of the, which was unemployed miners, um, they were not temperamentally suited to the discipline of wage labor, um, the building a railroad. Um, so Chinese were recruited for that job. So, um, and then Chinese, of course, are um, in some ways driven off of the gold fields by whites, but allowed to stick around to um, open restaurants or laundries, you know, to provide services in gold field communities where there was a shortage of women. Um, and um, and uh, white male miners didn't want them to do themselves domestic work. So they, um, Chinese, you know, become kind of niche, uh, a niche economy in these areas. So in Australia too, Chinese ran um, garden uh, farms that supplied food for not just miners, but for townspeople, um, there were, uh, Vegetable, they grew vegetables and they peddled them. They also owned, owned open small shops, you know, so they go into services. Um, so they, they find ways to be useful to the white community um, and um, are part of uh, the development of these uh, frontier areas after the frontier is initially broached, right, with the gold, discovery of gold. And then you have this period of time where it's just kind of crazy. Everybody's trying to get gold. Um, and then it settles down somewhat. And then the people who are not the serial rushers, right? But the people who stay, you know, they build communities and Chinese are part of these communities as well, but they, they work in certain niches and they also live in, in some, at some of the margins of those communities. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nye. I just want to ask, sorry, I'm going to use my privilege and ask one more question before I hand it back off to uh, Professor Kane. Um, I was, in thinking about your work, um, I have also been engaged very deeply um, in the last few months um, in reading um, research on Asian American studies. Um, as you know, um, Northeastern is um, finally um, hiring for uh, Asian American studies. We're having a cluster hire. I've been um, deeply immersed in this literature, and I've been trying to conceive, conceptualize what Asian American studies is. Um, you have, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have the very traditional um, 
uh, research on the um, experience of Asians in America, um, classic topics like Chinese exclusion, uh, Japanese internment, um, Southeast Asian refugees in the suburbs and so forth. Um, but there seems to be, in my opinion, um, emerging trends, um, emerging trends that are both uh, connective and comparative connective in the sense of trying to tie the history of Asia America within a broader global context, um, you know, trying to see how uh, migrants in, say, New York, um, their remittances might uh, help or benefit their villages back home, um, their native place uh, back home in China, for instance, um, or histories that are comparative, um, maybe looking at uh, certain types of domestic workers in the United States versus domestic workers in the Middle East, domestic mm -hmm. workers in, in, in Europe. Right. Um, and your, your book happens to, to check both of those boxes as well <laughs> and, and comparative. But I want to ask you, um, how, how should we think about um, you know, Asian American studies and you know, uh, how, what are sort of the, the emerging trends? Um, and, and, and after doing this sort of um, broad global studies, a global uh, study, um, you know, how, 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 how should Asian American studies specialists think about their work? Well, I, I don't feel I'm in a position to tell the field, you know, or people what to do, but um, I do think that um, putting, uh, regardless of what slice of Asian American history one is interested in, I think what, um, what is important these days is to uh, think relationally and to think uh, in bigger contexts. So, for example, when I said that Chinese exclusion law passed Congress in 1882 uh, because there was an alliance between the West and the South, I think that helps us think about um, settler racism on the frontier in the West, and it's as a kind of racism that is um, allied with white supremacy in the South. And, um, and, and so it helps us understand um, how Chinese exclusion fits into a larger picture of American politics. It's not just that there were these racists that hated Chinese and they wanted to exclude them. I mean, that's true, obviously, but why? And, um, and what does it represent? And, and it, it's, a different, it's a different racial idiom, right? It's not the same as anti-Black racism. But it is racism, and you have to understand it in its particularity and uh, in its historical context. So, um, so when I when I say that about the West and the South, um, so what about the North, right? So it, when you read the congressional record and they're debating the Chinese exclusion bills, well, first of all, it's not clear that it's going to pass. There are people in the Congress, in the House and in the Senate who say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean they're slaves? Are they really slaves? You know, I mean, they, uh, and then they say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you just give them some time, they'll just be like the Germans. You know, they'll become Americans. I mean, so this is not the majority view, but it, it comes up, right? And so you can see there's um, an anti-slavery his, history, an anti-slavery politics, that has not yet been completely stomped out. Um, and, and so it helped me understand better American sectional politics in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, and helped me understand that reconstruction and the retreat from reconstruction was not just a sectional question, but was actually a national question. So I think if we, if we only understand Chinese exclusion as the result of anti-Chinese racism, then we haven't, we haven't illuminated enough about the politics, the political context that that took place in. The second thing I would say is that I think it is really important for us to, to think more transnationally and globally. Um, I've been reading uh, a manuscript by an anthropologist who's writing about Chino Latinos, about uh, Chinese of Caribbean background uh, in the United States and how they have a particular kind of invisibility um, that's really hard for Americans um, to wrap their heads around, you know? Uh, so I think these are really interesting questions and they, they illuminate a lot of big, big picture issues for us. And so I think, you know, a Asian American studies, we had to go through, 
a long period of just establishing ourselves that we have a history that's worthy of um, study and for understanding. And I think we have, we've, we've done a lot. We understand a lot more now than we did 20, 30 years ago. Um, and now I think we can, we can say, well, we want to, we're part of a bigger conversation too. If you want to understand the rise of global capitalism in the late 19th century, here's something we can think about that adds to that picture, meaning the anti-Chinese movements and Chinese exclusion. Yeah, I mean, if these uh, laborers are the ones responsible for extracting so much of this gold that would eventually underpin the, the gold standard, I mean, that's a very a critical story as well. Um, as you said, they are, um, again, uh, uh, the essential workers of their day. Um, well, thank you very much, Professor Nye. Let me hand this back off to Professor Kane, um, who would like to um, feel perhaps offer one of her questions or get some other uh, questions in the audience. Absolutely. I actually, um, you, you speak about transnationalism and, you know, one of the questions is always sort of where do you cut it off, right? Like these projects can be bigger and bigger and bigger. And one of the, one of the things that you mentioned kind of in passing in your book is, you know, the presence of Chinese workers in Peru in the gold fields there and in Cuba. And I'm wondering what inspired you to settle on Anglo-American gold rushes specifically as a way of addressing the Chinese question? Was it because they were not coolie situations? Was it because, I mean, of the nature of the language um, in terms of access to sources? Can you tell us a little bit more about why you settle on these three? I mean, as you say, gold is everywhere, right? Um, and yet, you know, why, why focus on these three incidents? What does this selection illuminate in particular? Well, thank you. That's, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, uh, there, there's gold mining before the 19th century, but Chinese are not, I mean, they're involved in some gold mining in um, what's now Indonesia uh, in Southeast Asia, but the Chinese don't go to Brazil, for example, um, uh, or the, the other, some of the other earlier, the other earlier places before Brazil are more local, I think. Well, except for the conquistadors, but that's a whole other, that's a very early, much earlier history, right? Um, so, uh, so this phase of gold mining uh, that starts with California, I think we can say is a new phase of gold mining, which is, um, international uh, capital uh, intensive, I mean, it requires capital investment. You know, what starts as, um, you know, individuals and small groups uh, mining in rivers quickly becomes uh, very highly corporatized and capitalized enterprises. And so for gold to be, I mean, gold is everywhere, but it's not possible to be mined everywhere profitably, right? I mean, I mentioned in my book that um, it took, I don't know, two tons of ore in South Africa to yield one ounce of gold worth $20. You know, that's a tremendous expenditure of human and financial capital. Um, so, uh, so this is a new phase of gold mining that's um, very much part of um, the, globalization of capital and, and finance in the late 19th century. And it is the occasion where there's an international, you know, uh, migration of people from all over the world that go to all these places, right? And the Chinese are part of that. Uh, so I, uh, I focus on these three places. Uh, so that was the, the, the larger frame that I was interested in. Um, and then I focus on these three places because Chinese were there. Well, first, they're the three largest uh, uh, sites of gold mining. Um, two, that there were large numbers of Chinese that went to all three, although the South African case is a little different, right? Um, so it's interesting as a compare as a point of comparison uh, to the other two. And you know, I did three because you know people say, "Well, did you do Canada? Did you do New Zealand?" And, and I said, "No, I didn't." <laughs> That would have been that would have been another ten years, and I don't know if it would have revealed anything qualitatively different, right? I mean, for 
graduate students, you're working on dissertations or people who will run and write books that are comparative. I think three is the magic number, right? Two is not enough to really have enough comparison and three is a good number and four usually isn't necessary. So three is the magic number, that's my view. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm going to hand it back to Professor Tai now. Hi, thank you very much. I'm sorry. I, I just have so much more questions that I want to ask, and I'm going to be very greedy about this. So I, uh, Professor Nye, I just want to ask, um, you know, I, again, I've been thinking a lot about the field of Asian American studies. And one thing that um, people have, have, have asked me is, how do we make Asian American studies part of this, you know, part of the broader, broader uh, uh, curriculum? And also, how do we ensure that Asian American studies is not, you know, studied only by Asians or Asian Americans? Um, I, one way I could, I could point to, the, uh, you know, to push back against that is to highlight the global story that you, you present, which is that, you know, the story of Chinese laborers is not just about Chinese laborers. It's, you know, central to our understanding of, you know, of imperialism, capitalism, the underpinning of a financial system like the gold standard and so forth. But like, how, how, how would you basically try to address that? Because in order for us to not ensure that ethnic studies is remain, you know, a very narrow niche, we have to broaden it, right? Or we have to encourage um, people, different uh, uh, kinds of students to take these kinds of courses. So how, you know, this is a perennial challenge, I'm sure, um, for, for not just Asian American studies, but all sorts of, of ethnic studies. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about that. Well, thanks, that's a great question. I think um, we, can, we can conceive of and frame courses uh, that um, uh, in, their, kind of in their, their names or their titles kind of suggest um, that broader context or relevance. So um, like I teach, I teach a course regularly called Transnational Migration and Citizenship. And it draws heavily from Asian American studies and uh, Latino studies um, and, but also European study, you know, it's, it's a broad course. And so, um, but the syllabus includes works by Asian Americanists and by Latino his, uh, scholars, right? Um, and if you uh, wanna do a course, um, on borderlands, right? Borderlands uh, can be imagined in a very capacious way. Um, and so you can kind of craft ethnic studies classes in ways that speak to a theme that um, people are interested in, right? So um, there are students who are interested in um, uh, global labor history, right? So um, now if you did a course on labor history in a certain region of the world. I mean, I think you would get people who are interested in that region, but you, you would also get people who are uh, just curious, right? Um, so uh, I think if you had a course called Asian American history, um, you, you, I mean, I've taught that and you get, you get some, you do get non-Asians in those courses, but uh, you mostly get Asian Americans. And I think that's okay too. Um, but I think you know a lot of uh, a lot of work by Asian American scholars is uh, well received in courses that are more thematic and and um, comparative in nature. Um, a colleague of mine at Columbia just taught my book um, in the uh, Introduction to International and Global History course, which is um, a required course for our master's students in international history. Um, so, you know, I think people see, see the connections and then they can make them in the court, in the classroom. So I think if you, if you have some imagination and how you craft your courses, you will get students that are not just Asian Americans. Yeah, I think this is a perennial challenge for Asian American studies because in speaking with other um, historians of Asian America, for instance, um, they complain that uh, their history is uh, ignored by the wider field of American history. Um, Asian American historians have to uh, demonstrate the relevance um, of their story to the field uh, uh, as a whole. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I find that very um, interesting because it's, uh, it, it, it reminds me of 
of continual efforts of one side to sort of speak to the other side, but the other side is maybe not uh, not speaking back. Um, I don't know if that's your experience, but I, I heard that from a uh, complaint from from some 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 scholars of, of Asian America out there. Hmm. Um, I think perhaps the way in which we have traditionally uh, crafted and offered courses um, that they are they are seen by others as being narrow. So I think we it's our job is to show how it's not narrow you could teach the same content but you you pitch it and you contextualize it in a way that's not narrow um and then increasingly you have um works done by asian americans who uh that those books can be taught in 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 courses so um uh i'm trying to think of an example well, I mean, I'm, I'm very selfishly thinking of my former students, like Ellen Wu's book, um, The Color of Success, about the origins of the model minority. That's a great book to teach in a course on the Cold War, right? Um, uh, so I think it's, uh, I don't know, I think you just have to, you just have to demonstrate that it's relevant to the broader field of American history. I should break in and say I've taught excerpts from that book in a history of education seminar. Uh -huh. So like I've seen it, you know, in lots of different places. <laughs> right. Or my book, The Lucky Ones, um, I've heard people say they teach it in courses on the history of the family. Yeah. I had not, I had not thought about that when I was writing it, but uh, people teach it in um, courses on the family. So that's interesting, right? Yeah, and of course, uh, the history of, of uh, Chinese exclusion is central to the making of the modern um, U.S. immigration system. So uh, right. just a, a course on the history of migration, the history of immigration, or the history of, of the U.S., um, as your book and book by, by Erica Lee has have demonstrated that um, this is central to our understanding of the larger history of, of the United States. Um, I do, um, I'd love to continue this conversation, but I also want to give some time um, to Mika to make that very important announcement about the, uh, the, uh, about the next event and the book raffle. So um, Professor Nye, I want to thank you so much uh, for sharing your, uh, your, your book and your thoughts about um, the history of Chinese workers, but also just about your thoughts about Asian American studies more generally. Um, that is very appreciated. Um, I want to thank also Professor Kane um, for adroitly handling uh, the Q&A. Um, I apologize if we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, and I want to thank the audience um, as well for joining us. And let me go ahead and now hand it off uh, to Mika um, for, to, for her to make a few announcements. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Zoom cues are always hard to read. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Tai, and thank you, um, Professor Nye and Professor Kane from me as well, as well to the audience who tuned in today. Um, I'm going to be making several announcements regarding the Asia, America, and the World series, which this talk is a part of. Our next talk is going to be uh, next semester. This is our last talk of fall 2021. Next semester, uh, the first talk will be on Thursday, February 10th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, both in person and online. It will be a hybrid event. The speaker will be Sangay Mishra from Drew University. He will be speaking on race, religion, and belonging of South Asian Americans 20 years after 9-11. We hope to see you there. And regarding this particular talk, um, we will be sending out a feedback form to all folks who registered for this event. We would highly encourage you to fill out that feedback form for two reasons. One, obviously um, it's fantastic to receive feedback to both improve on our events and to indicate the importance of these events to our campus and to our student body, as well as an opportunity if you do fill out this form to win a book in the book raffle if you indicate that you are interested in being entered. We do have two of Professor Nye's books that were mentioned today. So the first is The Lucky Ones, and the second is the Chinese question. And if you uh, enter into the raffle, then you will have a chance to win either of these books and we will be in touch with you if that is the case. 
that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you so much to everybody for joining us and for speaking with us. And we look forward to seeing you in February. Have a great winter break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.